My name is Rachel Graham. I'm a second year medical student and a clinical anatomy fellow here at Seattle Science Foundation. And today I'll be talking about classifications of odontoid fractures. So what I hope you'll take away from this talk is that we'll begin to get an understanding of how odontoid fractures are classified, that we can highlight the ambiguities presented by each systems, and hopefully we can generate a discussion on how to mediate these issues going forward. So just to give a little bit of background, you recall that the odontoid process is a feature of the axis, or C2. Johal et al. described its morphology as a superior projection from the vertebral body of C2. Moreover, Tubbs et al. Uh, reported that developmentally, the odontoid process originated from C1 and fused inferiorly with the vertebral body of C2. So just to give a background on anatomy, there, the dens is stabilized to the vertebral column by various ligaments. So here we can see the superior longitudinal band superiorly, and anterior to that would be the apical ligament, which connects the foramen magnum to the superior portion of the odontoid process. The transverse ligament of the atlas um, fastens the posterior aspect of the dens to the anterior arch of C1. And we can also see the alar ligament, which is connecting the lateral masses on either side to the odontoid process. Furthermore, for vasculature, uh, there's various arteries, including the apical arcade artery, the posterior and anterior ascending arteries, cleft perforating arteries, and contributions from the ascending pharyngeal artery. It's important to note here that the neck of the odontoid process is the less vascularized portion, and this will come into play later on. So odontoid fractures account for approximately 10% of all cervical vertebral fractures. Odontoid fractures can occur as a result of hyperflexion or hyperextension. More often, you'll tend to see it with hyperflexion. So in the beginning, in the beginning, Anderson and Delonzo created the first classification for odontoid fractures. So picture yourself in 1974. Lewis Anderson and Richard Delando, Delonzo combed through data from the past 12 years, and they found 60 patients who had fractures of the odontoid process. So they said to themselves, oh, and in the, this is specifically in a hospital in Memphis, to clarify. So they said to themselves, let's come up with a system or some kind of way to organize these fractures. Now, the Anderson and Delonzo classification system was very specific, and they depicted that the prognosis of a patient could be related to the anatomical location of the fracture line. So type one, according to the system, is an oblique fracture through the upper part of the odontoid process. They suggested that it results because of an avulsion fracture at the point where the ALR ligament uh, connects with the odontoid process. Type 1 is considered stable. What does that mean? Most likely, no neural elements will be compromised during this kind of fracture. Type 2 was considered to be a fracture at the neck of the odontoid process, or it's also been depicted to be at the junction between the odontoid process and the body of C2. And that is considered to be unstable. Now, you recall earlier that I mentioned that the neck of the odontoid is the lesser vascularized area. So most likely, this is the reason why it's more prone to fractures. Type three extends is a fracture that extends into the cancellous portion of the vertebral body. Now, traditionally, type three fractures have been recounted as stable. But more and more, uh, as time progresses, there are more cases uh, arising where there's uh, less stability. So more so, it's not stable. So what about displacement? Now, the Anderson and Delonzo system didn't mention the idea that, well, fractures don't have to stay at their original site. So what happens in that case? And how do we classify those fractures? In 1981, the Roy Camille system was developed to cover fractures that were angled and displaced from the original site. So their classification was a little bit more specific. 
To them, a type one fracture would be from anterior to posterior, slanted inferiorly. A type two fracture from anterior to posterior would be slanted superiorly. Type three would be a transverse or horizontal cut. And type four would be considered a policeman's hat fracture. Now, what about communition? Well, what do you mean? Is it possible for fractures to have little bits of fragments with them? What do we do then? What system should they be placed under? So, eight years later, Dr. Mark Haley created a system to ascertain that fractures can be communicated at the base of dents. Fracture fragments can be either anterior or posterior. So now we're beginning to see that as time progresses, there's new cases and more inclusion of, of different features of a fracture. So here, on radiographic imaging, how easy is it to tell the difference between a low type two fracture, now we remember that type two is a fracture at the neck, right, and a high type three, which is a fracture that extends through the vertebral body. Now, we can kind of see at this point where sometimes things may get a little bit confusing as to, well, where exactly do I draw the line between a type two and a type three? Gruer uh, created a classification, fast forwarding to 2005, uh, to break down type two fractures a little bit further. Type 2A is mainly characterized as non-displaced, so it's a fracture where that the odontoid process does not move from its original site. Type 2B is displaced, and type 3 is, sorry, type 2C is characterized as comminuted. Type 3 fractures may have involvement of the superior articular facets. So here, this is just an image to kind of illustrate um, what I was previously said about fractures. So type 2A being uh, not displaced and not comminuted. Type 2B being displaced most often. And type 2C being characterized by communition. There are other factors associated with type 2B and type 2C, let me just say that. So gray areas. Hmm. So to highlight, the terminologies used to depict each type of fracture is often not consistent in the literature. What do I mean? Within a single system, different uh, words are used to depict the same type of fracture. Also, um, often there's not a clear line of demarcation between one type of fracture and another type of fracture within each system. And treatment. The most important thing is these systems should be created to allow for more effective treatment. So this is just an example to kind of highlight um, that depending on which system we're under, the treatment options are different. Now there's a lot of debate in the literature about what's the best way to treat these fractures, but this is just an example here. And just to show, so the baby here has a cervical collar, and here in the radiographic image you can see that there's some sort of screw fixation and wiring posteriorly and halo immobilization. So just to give an example, um, for type one fractures, it's been depicted as the proximal portion of the odontoid process. So, and also as the most apical part. So when we use those terms, it's like, yeah, I think I, I have an understanding here that I know where we are, but when it comes, there's points in times where it gets a little bit ambiguous and we want to make sure that we know exactly where that fracture line occurs and where to make that difference, where to draw that line. Uh, type 2 has been described as the neck of the odontoid process, as I mentioned earlier, or at the junction between the base of the dens and the vertebral body. So where is that junction? And how can we ascertain that that's reproducible uh, for each person? Type 3 is, uh, been, has been depicted as a broad-based fracture and has been described as being with or without involvement of the superior articular facets. So the question arises, what if it's a fracture that extends through the vertebral body but does not involve the superior articular facet? Does it have to be one or both? So here's a novel case. A case report by Adam et al. reported a 91-year-old female who had cervical trauma secondary to a ground-level fall. 
As you can see in the image, the fracture line begins at the neck of the odontoid process and proceeds upwards at an oblique trajectory. What category does this fall under? None, right? So Adam and Sergen created their own classification system to depict this. And as we can notice, it's very specific that it uh, characterizes specifically a fracture at the base of the odontoid process with an oblique inferior right trajectory. Proposition, what can we do to make things a little bit clearer? So an ideal classification system should be adaptable and that someone from Asia should be able to uh, characterize fractures in the same way as someone from Africa or someone from the United States. It should be simple. It should be easy to follow, easy to remember. It should attest the likely outcome of the patient, so the prognosis. It should mention nerve damage. What about arteries, right? And most importantly, it should improve clinical decision making. So my suggestion is uh, several things. One thing that I found uh, most important is let's take a look in the literature and see what are the three or let's say the four top most important things that a surgeon considers when figuring out or a physician how to treat these patients. Let's use those and find a way to incorporate those three characteristics or those three factors into an existing successful classification system. Now, also for each of these systems, uh, for each of these systems that I've mentioned, testing is needed for both the predictive validity and reliability. So we need to really examine and see how effective are these existing classification systems. Lastly, I would like to acknowledge special thanks uh, to each of you for being here today. Thanks to the Seattle Science Foundation for allowing me to speak. Thank you.